this offset over here is All right. Well, it is great to be with you this morning. Um, as Pastor Robin mentioned, um, me and my family were away. We enjoyed a couple of weeks of vacation, and we appreciate the opportunity to do that. We got to uh, do a bit of a road trip. Um, went up north to visit some friends of ours in the New Liskard area. If you've never been up there, it's far. <laughs> and um, the mosquitoes up there are breathtaking. Um, <laughs> It is wonderful. And uh, yeah, and then we were able to spend some time at a cottage and do some other day trips. It was great. We, we come back. I, I personally think when you come back from a vacation and your first day back at work, you're like, oh, yes, routine. You've had a good break, right? It's not like, oh, I haven't been away. It feels like I never left. It was, no, it was very good. So we appreciate that, but it's great to be back. And I'm, uh, I'm excited to be able to uh, share God's word with us this morning. Um, just before I do, um, let's take a, take a minute and pray, uh, just that our hearts will be open to what God has for us, and, and also remembering some of our needs. I, I've been a little bit out of the loop, but I know we've got, uh, we've always got folks struggling with, uh, with health concerns, and there's beat up baseball players, you know, with broken parts and things, and so let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll dive in. Gracious Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this church family, and Lord, we thank you for your word. We're so blessed, Lord, and on a day like this when we can gather, and our biggest problem is that our front projector in our building isn't working. Lord, we, uh, we are reminded of how very, very blessed we are. We pray that those kind of setbacks would only remind us of, of what's really important and help us to appreciate the things we have. Lord, I, we thank you for your word, and, and I pray that as we look into it this morning, that you would speak by your spirit through your word, through uh, my words as I speak, Lord, give me clarity and help me to speak things that are only true. And open our hearts uh, to receive what you would have for us this morning, Lord. We want to come away changed. We want to grow closer to you, and we know that, that you do that in our hearts. And so, Lord, we, we want to cooperate with you. Lord, we think of those in our church family who are struggling and suffering today. There are some that, that can't be with us because they're uh, they're dealing with uh, with illness or injuries. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with them and be their peace and strength in this time of suffering and help us as a church family to, to, to think of them and remember them and reach out to them, Lord. We pray for, uh, for Isabel Archer as she's adapting to, uh, to her new home at Crescent Care. And, and Lord, even just this morning talking with uh, or texting with, with Jared, and whose back is for Jared Fulkerson, Lord, we just pray that you would um, you touch his body as well. And Lord, you know the needs that all of us bring uh, day by day, week by week. We need you. So Lord, we bring all those things and just lay them before you, knowing that you are a God. Here's our prayer. It cares for us and will meet our every need. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, just on the way by, I found it amusing. I'm glad Pastor Rob mentioned it. But uh, when, the, when the projector's down and everyone has to turn around, you get to see who sits in the balcony. You know who doesn't like that? <laughs> People in the balcony. Oh, that first song. I'm sorry, guys. Buckle Snell inside. I was going to name any names, but we all know who you are. We're just going to sneak in late and stand up here and watch everybody looking at us. You know, I noticed in the later songs, they were great turnaround. Just so focused on the lyrics, which was amazing. Sorry to call you out. But I just found it really funny. Um, as, as Pastor Robin mentioned, we just got done our baseball season for our, our church. I guess I'm not supposed to call it baseball. <coughs> slow pitch, very slow pitch, our law ball season. Um, and it's, it's been a great experience for me because I was actually on the C League team this year um, because we don't have a D League team. And, um, so I was... I was on it, and I was actually thinking about that experience. Um, I missed a bunch of games, but a lot of us did. Fortunately, the team was fairly large, so uh, we were able to kind of make it work. And as we uh, as we kind of wrapped up the season yesterday, we had a great barbecue over at Tony and Janice's and stuff. I was thinking about that and, and thinking about um, how that relates so clearly to what we're wanting to talk about, because we're moving through this series about growing in Christ, and this morning we're talking about growing through acceptance. And I thought, what a great picture of acceptance. You know, here's me who hasn't played any form of baseball in literally decades. And even when I played anything like regularly, I wasn't that great. 
And when I'm like, well, actually, I didn't even come and beg and ask to be on the team. They're like, you should play. Are you going to play this year? Come on. You know what you want to. And when I'm like, ah, all right, I'll play. They accepted me. There was no tryouts. There was no physical. I don't know if they regretted this, but if they did, they never said it because, because I was just accepted onto the team. You know, and I'd probably embarrass him, but, but uh, Jason Nutturn was just, a, he's an amazing coach, but just an amazing guy at making the whole dynamics of this team work. And he's a good ball player. And I'm really not. Like, really not. You know, but I'm out there throughout the season demonstrating my utter lack of skill by striking out frequently and missing key catches in the field. And I never once got anything but acceptance and encouragement from the team. Not once. And I really didn't deserve it at all, right? And, and uh, the acceptance that I experienced on that team, it created the optimum atmosphere for growth as a ball player. It did, right? They weren't riding me, they weren't like, oh, here he is, Jure's up to bat again. Well, you will just count that as a strikeout, and that's three, let's get up to the field, right? Like, they didn't, there was none of that. There was none. Now, I don't know what it was like on our other team. I, they didn't ask me to play on Oxford 1. It's Oxford 2. That's okay. It was, uh, it was the optimal atmosphere for growth. And as you've been looking at various ways for people to grow in Christ, and some of the conditions of that growth, I don't think we can overestimate the importance of acceptance. We are accepted by God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this opens the door for all of this growth that we've been talking about. It literally opens the door for it. I want us to, uh, to read together in Romans chapter 5. If you've got your Bible, you've opened it to Romans 5. We're just going to look at the first 11 verses together. And um, I, I printed it because I didn't know if my Bible would knock this thing over. So this is just cut and paste it from BibleGateway.com. Okay, this is... Um, so here's what it says. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, God, or Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. There is a lot going on in that passage. And I, I'm so intimidated preaching out of Romans. <laughs> because it feels like, like that's a big boy book. You don't go there unless you're ready to know what you're doing. But I'm going to try... To, to look at this passage and, and, and pull out of it what Paul is talking about. And I think a lot of what he says has to do with our acceptance. I think, I think you could sum up those 11 verses in basically what it says in, in verse 2. I think we are accepted by God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We've been accepted. Okay? I want us to look at three kind of ideas related to this. And first, I've kind of mentioned this. Acceptance is... It's foundational for our growth in Christ. By foundational, I mean um, it comes first, and it's very, very difficult to proceed if it's not there, right? Anyone who's ever built anything like a building knows that you kind of got to start at the bottom and work up, and if you skimp on that part, um, Leaning Tower of Pisa, okay? But it's your shed, you know? It's, so foundational stuff is important, and, and so we see that acceptance, I mean, it makes sense, right, logically. If we're going to grow in Christ, we have to understand how we approach that. And the first thing that we see is that our acceptance in our acceptance by God through Christ is it's an act of God's grace. Okay, right off the bat, he makes that very, very clear. 
right? We've been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on and on and talks about it a couple of times in that passage, how this is God acting on our behalf. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, similar to me on the baseball team, I wasn't accepted because I was awesome. I was just accepted. And turned out to be really not awesome. I don't want to harp on that, but if you didn't come to the games, it was, it was breathtaking. But, um... So it's, it's an act of God's grace. It's not based on our acceptability. And if you've, been, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, or even kind of hanging around the church and hearing sermons, you've probably heard this idea. And I, I suspect that it's the kind of thing that you could hear over and over again, but not fully grab. And I'm going to try, again, to lay it out so that if that's you today, grasp it a little bit more clearly, a little bit more tightly. And I'm in that same boat. Of, of all the doctrines, this is the one that I probably struggle with um, getting a hold of. Personally, it's the one I can, I can lose my grip on easiest, right? It's, uh, it can be a tricky one, but our acceptance is, it's an act of God's grace. It's not us making ourselves acceptable to be to God, or Him finding us acceptable, like He sifts us all out and goes, okay, well, you, 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 and you, right, and the rest, not so much. It's, it's totally based on God's grace towards us. And this is, this is probably the crucial truth of the Gospel. This is what makes Christianity unique. Right? There's all sorts of different religious systems. Some call themselves religions, and some don't. Well, we're not a religion, we're just a little philosophy. But if you break it down, it generally comes down to, look, here's some things that you got to do, and here's some things that you got to not do. And the more you do these things and not do those things, well, fill in the blank, it'll be better for you, right? This is the deal. Or conversely, you can have a system that basically says, that's hard, so we're just going to put everything in the stuff that's okay to do pop up category, because... Not doing stuff that you want to do and doing things that are difficult, that's, that's hard. So let's just, let's just say it's all good. And Christianity is unique because it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate sin. It doesn't say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you do, it's all good. It never says that. And if anybody says that that's the whole idea of Christianity, they're horribly confused. But Christianity never says, hey, the whole idea is that you're a sinner and you need to stop sinning so that you can be saved. No. That's not it, right? It's you were a sinner and Christ died for you and you paid the price. You trust in His work on your behalf. And through a miracle that we don't fully grasp the, the size of it, we can say the words, I don't think we get it. It's like trying to swallow a battleship. But we put our trust in Christ and God credits us with the righteousness of Christ. He credits you, you dirty sinner. Sorry, I'm pointing to everybody and myself. I know, we all look on Sunday mornings, but you know what's in your heart. God knows what's in your heart, and He says, you know what, you trust in Christ, I will, I will credit His righteousness to you. Utter righteousness. This is what Christianity is based on, and this acceptance that we now have with God through Christ is the foundation for all our things. He goes on to say what I just mentioned, it's access by faith. Okay? He says, we, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't just say we have peace through Jesus Christ. This is very important. He says peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our means yours and mine, right? So he's writing to believers. And he describes Jesus Christ not merely as our benefactor, but he is our Lord. Lord being a ruler of utter authority in your life. So if you lived in some kind of olden days and there was a king or an emperor, that person was your lord. They basically owned you. They could show up and demand anything of you at any time. And your only response was, okay, or death. Right? They owned you, they owned your stuff. If they wanted to send you off on a stupid war and into a battle that they knew you would get killed, like, yes sir, and you go and die. If they say, I want you to work on this farm, I'll say, okay, whatever. I want your daughter. I want your son. I want... A Lord is someone in your life with utter authority. We don't like that in our modern, very independent North American society. We don't have anyone like that publicly. But Paul makes no questions about this. Jesus Christ, if you have 
if you put your faith in him, is our Lord. Okay? So let's not get confused. This peace that we have with God, this acceptance that we have from God that's so foundational to our life in Christ, is not, I mean, it's, it's available to everybody, but not everyone is in it. It's not, it's not automatic. It's only accessed through faith. So it doesn't mean that everyone is accepted automatically. Our default setting is still, like it says in verse 10, enemies of God. While you were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us, right? If, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So what does that mean? That means all of us started out as God's enemies. Those of us who put our faith in Christ have had that status changed amazingly. But if you don't put your faith in Christ, your default setting is still enemy of God, enemy of the state, enemy of, of the rightful Lord. So, again, and I don't think there's anybody here that struggles with this, but I, it's, it's the truth and we know that this is out here. But um, there are many who will read a passage like this and say, see, Christ's grace and forgiveness is so big that it just kind of utterly covers everyone. And if he died for all the sins of the world, then ultimately, when the dust settles, everyone will be reconciled to God through Christ. And that, that is such a comforting kind of doctrine, if it were true. And it would be so happy if it was in the Bible. Right? Because who wants to talk about the idea of ultimately there being a judgment, and ultimately there being two destinations, and you might end up not where you thought you were going. You might end up spending an eternity separated from God. Oh, that... That is really uncomfortable, Pastor. Who, who wants to... Isn't that a little outdated, this hellfire and brimstone stuff? Absolutely. The Bible is a very old book. And it's been in there the whole time. I don't like it any more than you, honestly. But it's there. So let's not get confused. This is not ammunition for what we call universalism. That says universally everyone will be saved by God's grace. God loves the whole world. And he sent his son... So that anyone who believes in his son will not perish. Extrapolate that logically. He loved the whole world, so he sent his son for the whole world. The default setting is that they will perish, right? If they don't put their faith in his son. So the exclusivity of Christianity, unfortunately, if you're a, a modern sensitive type, is right here in this passage and we can't avoid it. It's accessed by faith. But once we access it by faith, oh man, the good stuff. When we access it by faith, we get to stand in grace and rejoice in hope. I'm, I'm laying it out like that because that's what the filling your blanks on your notes are like. But I want to talk about each of those. Because he talks about this in, in uh, verse 2 and 3, right? Through, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope.